Magic is a game where it's important to manage your resources. So let's talk about mana and cards. Which is more important, access to mana or access to cards? Pause the video and think for a second. Did you get an answer? Well, first let's talk about when each is more important. Getting access to more mana is most powerful when you have the least. Getting an extra land when you only have one doubles your available mana, but getting an extra land when you have ten is barely noticeable. But this effect does not scale well to larger numbers. This is also why a turn one soul ring is crazy powerful, but a turn four soul ring might only be met with shrugs. But that's not all. Since many mana sources untap during your untap step, mana access often generates value over time. And this, I'd argue, is the more important number. At least, one of the more important numbers, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Getting more mana access is strongest early game, and loses power over time. The same is not true for card access. At the start of the game is when you have the least amount of mana, and so can't use many of the cards that you might gain access to often losing access to them. What's more though, the power of having card access is about having options with which to navigate the game state. When you're empty-handed and have no options, gaining options is one of the strongest things you can do. But if you already got a full grip, drawing one more card just doesn't give you that much more maneuverability with which to navigate the game. So card access gains strength when you have fewer cards in hand, and actually have the mana to play those cards. Both of these things occur naturally in the late stages of the game. Card access starts off weaker and gets stronger as the game goes on. So which is stronger? Well, not every game has a turn 10, but most games do have a turn 2, so if that's how you thought about it, then mana access is more reliably important to every deck, so that's where you should put your investments, on solid mana access packages. Which kinds of mana and card access are best? First, let's talk mana. Most ubiquitous are mana rocks. Since earlier is better and two cost rocks are abundant, these tend to be more popular, while three cost rocks are almost unplayable unless they're doing much, much more than mana. They're easy to cast and are in every color identity and can be used the turn they come in to make more lifetime mana. There are also a lot of enchantments that do this as well but the best are Wild Growth and Utopia Sprawl, which both favor green decks with minimal color identity. Exploration effects that let you play additional lands might be the weakest kind of ramp since it costs you additional resources, and the infrastructure required to continue to feed it so that it reaches its full potential is often a heavy enough cost to leech the health away from the rest of the deck. Creatures that tap for mana, or mana dorks, are affected by summoning sickness, so it can't be used immediately. When it comes down cheap, it's usually only in one color, and when it comes down heavy, it usually makes more than one mana or more than one color of mana. Cost reducers, a dork's cooler older sibling, usually only reduce generic mana costs, but apply it to all spells you cast, and so do the most work when you cast more spells, encouraging you to storm off. Then there are land fetchers, some of the most potent forms of mana access available, and their status as staples is well earned. More complex decks especially favor this kind of mana access because it interacts with multiple zones at once, and has two things that the other kinds don't. The first is its longevity. Unlike artifact or creature ramp, lands are less likely to be removed because of how commander players think about land destruction, and harder to remove in mass quantities, which is how they often come. The second and most misunderstood, most undervalued quality of these cards is their ability to thin the deck. To answer this question fully, we need to take a look at a famous math problem. For anyone not familiar, it goes like this. Play a minigame with three face-down cards. Two of them are cards you don't want, which could be lands when you don't need them, or just a spell that's not very good right now. You choose one of them. At the end of this minigame, you'll put the chosen card into your hand, but we're not finished yet. After you've chosen a card, one of the bad cards is revealed, and you're given the chance to change your chosen face-down card. The question at the heart of the problem is this. Should you switch your choice? 
If you'd like, pause the video now and come up with an answer. As it happens, it does matter whether you change your mind. Your first decision in this minigame has three outcomes, only one of which is a good card. Your second decision has only two outcomes, for a grand total of six outcomes, four of which result in a positive result if you chose to change your mind. This result was fairly controversial when it was first discovered because of how unintuitive it was. If you'd like to learn more about this problem, I've attached some links in the description. For our subject today though, what I want you to notice is that the reason that this works is because that probability density didn't change just because you got new information. That is to say, moving a bad card out of the way does not reset the probability. But if we ask the same questions after shuffling the cards randomly before your second choice, the probability changes to 50-50. Moving a card out of the way doesn't reset probability, but shuffling does. What that means for us is that thinning the deck by a land is better than scrying a land to the bottom. That's not really saying much since scrying could result in many other scenarios besides scrying a land to the bottom, but it gives us a baseline. That said, thinning the deck is also usually much more useful since it usually involves putting a card in the graveyard, which is infinitely more accessible than putting a card on the bottom of your library. There are a lot of good reasons to be skeptical that this has a lot of impact. After all, it's just one less card out of a hundred. But if we were to play devil's advocate here, it's worth noting that the real number is never one out of a hundred, it's closer to one out of ninety, and even then, that's not really the number that matters most. It's these. If you've never been involved in the CEDH scene, that might seem strange, but the reasoning is simple. The beginning of those games is the back half of these games. These players are starting the game with access to more than enough mana to top their curve, and are trying their hardest to close out the game as fast as possible. The same things can be said of casual games, but only towards the back half of the game, when drawing one more land isn't as great, and drawing that extra removal spell or value piece might determine the winner. These cards put lands on the field now when you need them most by removing them from the late game when you need them least, causing the land count's slow convergence to a CEDH deck as the game goes on. If your early game mana is important, but your late game mana is not, then you won't find much better than land fetchers. Lastly, temporary mana from treasures, free casts, and rituals is the least like all other forms of mana access. First, because it's temporary, so that you don't get the same kind of returns that you would over the game's lifetime. And second, because you're not actually profiting here. Spending two mana to make two mana just puts you down a card for no reason. You didn't access any more mana than you would have otherwise, so why bother with this? It's subtle, but the difference also has to do with that time offset. Having a surge of temporary mana makes your timeline skip ahead several turns, replicating that CEDH casual time offset. But a deck that doesn't have the setup to follow that mana often flops. If you have the setup for it, that mana can be game end. But if you don't, it might do more harm than good. So those are all the kinds of mana access and their uses. But what about card access? The simplest and most abundant form is card draw. Because of that simplicity, it's the easiest form to synergize and interact with. Because you want to be drawing these cards in the back half of the game when there's less time, draw over time effects are always going to be worse than burst draw effects. But you don't always use all the cards that you draw. Unless you don't have anything better to do, it's rare that you use all your options and open all the doors available to you. So it might be better to spend a little less mana to draw fewer cards that are higher quality. And for that, there's impulse draw and anticipate effects. Related are divvy effects that move multiple cards around between zones and are great for all the same reasons that land fetchers are great and then some. Other colors have other versions of this kind of card to hand effect, but each with their own spin on it. Black only gets creatures, green gets permanents, and red and white get a different restriction every time it's printed. But you wouldn't need any of those card to hand effects if you could cast those spells from some other zone like these effects allow, essentially turning each card to two cards. Lastly, top deck play is the gift that keeps on giving. 
Each card you play off the top rewards you with more card access, getting better and better the more cards you play and encouraging you to storm off. Some effects can blur the line, it can be both mana and card access, but those seem like their own thing, so we won't discuss them here. Some of these effects amplify each other's strengths when paired together, and make for extremely potent resource packages. The last thought I want to leave you with is about mana allocation, about how you're spending your mana. Suppose each player only has access to so much mana in a game. Let's say you spent some mana on interaction, on card draw, and on ramp. Generally speaking, the more mana you have available to spend on advancing your game plan, the more successful you'll be. So if you can spend less mana holding back your opponents, or invest in interaction that can do that while advancing your game plan, you're most certainly better off. But the same is also true for the other slices. Finding cards that can work on multiple axes is going to help you focus where your mana is spent, while also engaging with the rest of the game.